this episode I'm going to show an interview I did with Robert Greeby. He is an outstanding personality in the field of light guns. In the mid 80s he founded iCAT, a company which sold interactive full motion video based laser training systems to law enforcement and military forces. Towards the end of the 80s he left iCAT to found American Laser Games, which developed FMV based light gun arcade games. American Laser Games later stepped into the home video game market. In the mid 90s, the daughter company Her Interactive came to life. This company is still operational today. Sadly, we had trouble getting Mr. Greeby's camera to work. The only visual piece I was able getting is this frozen frame of video. As a substitute, I'm going to show trailers and gameplay footage of American Laser Games titles. Could you talk about your time with iCAT? The iCAT system was the, you know, kind of the basis of the, you know, the video game line. It evolved from that. And uh, so we had started out to, to be a company that provided this uh, live action training in what's called the shoot and no shoot scenario to police officers primarily, but then we also found that there was some demand for the product uh, among the special operations side of the military. So we, you know, produced that product and we enjoyed um, relatively good success, uh, but we certainly saw that uh, when we demonstrated the system that people uh, really enjoyed the experience. And so it um, became, you know, somewhat of a thought that, you know, if we you know, actually converted it over into a video game that we could, you know, really even enhance that uh, experience and have something that was very successful. I thought that a significant contribution that made you leaving iCAT to turn to the arcade business was seeing a photography of someone using the iCAT simulation while having a big grin in his face. Is this true? Yes, that's, that's right. So we had um, attended a uh, trade show that was in uh, Dallas, Texas, and it was actually a trade show for companies that uh, um, manufactured simulators for the military. And so we had, uh, you know, people that were trying out the system, and one of them was a uh, general, and he he tried it out, and he just, you know, was having a having a ball doing it. He was just obviously enjoying it. And so one of our um, people snapped a photograph of him where he was just had a very broad grin on his face. And as we came back from that trade show, and we're we were looking through the, you know, photographs, and I saw that, and it just, you know, it was kind of the aha moment. I thought, geez, you know, this could this could be a video game. Could you tell us more details on how you left ICAT? We made a decision to get out of this firearms training business uh, and felt like that there was more opportunity for the company in the video game side of the business. I think that we were selling a product to the government, and the government uh, has a you know it's a very long uh, pipeline, if you will, in terms of and there's a lot of expense involved and in, and in, you know showing the product to them and meeting with them and sending in proposals and so forth and you know quite honestly there was a lot of appeal to the video game side because someone just liked it and they'd just write a check and buy it. So it was much quicker. So we had at that time uh, venture capital partners, and they, you know, agreed that that was a better course. So we sold off the iCat uh, product to another company, and you know, got out of that business entirely. How did you manage to delve into the video game arcade business? Did you already have a job in a similar field? No, I, I was a stockbroker. We traveled to a uh, trade show that was uh, for uh, people in the video arcade business, and we took along with it a, um, actually, a, I think a VHS tape of the system being used, and we showed that to some people there that were in the business, and we found some that were very interested in it. And they encouraged us to go ahead and develop it into the game. And so then that resulted in us creating the Mad Dog McCree game. Were you a gamer yourself? 
No, I actually was not, uh, even though I, you know, played, you know, some video games, but this was back, you know, quite a few years ago. And I certainly did go into arcades and play some of the games, but I was not uh, what one would term a gamer. Do you still have operational gaming systems at home? Uh, no. You have worked in both very serious simulations meant for training and video games supposed to be used as means of enjoyment. Which field did you like better? Well, I enjoyed both of them, really. Um, you know, I enjoyed the the adventure aspects, the real-life adventure aspects of the simulator product because, you know, we were working with people that were in law enforcement and, and we also did some work for the uh, United States Army Delta Force. And so they were, you know, the very, uh, you know, top end of, of, of soldiering there. And, and it, you know, it was very uh, gratifying to produce something that was of value to those people and to, to be able to see how they worked and, uh, you know, that was uh, that was a lot of fun you know there's no question about it which of your arcade games you enjoyed the most to develop well i think the first game that we did the mad dog game was uh you know was all uh uh you know kind of a venture into uncharted territory and so we didn't really know what exactly what we were doing and so that was fun and uh, the fact that it was um you know a western game with the story and was revolutionary at the time no one else had done anything quite like that the word you know it was a video game that was like a, a movie and that you could actually you know change the plot uh, of the film and so uh you know that was fun and the amount of money that we spent to make it was i think you know around seventy five thousand dollars which we went on to sell uh i you know over you know 45 million dollars worth of it so that was a pretty good investment uh and it you know the production of it was uh you know a matter of months and you know now of course a game will take you know a couple of years from start to finish and I think we were probably through it in four or five months. So, you know. Speaking of Mad Dog, I remember I was so shocked when I learned that the actor who played Mad Dog, Russ Dillon, is blonde in real life and had his hair dyed for the game. Another shock was to learn that his eyes are really that deep blue and you guys did not use any tricks for that. Yeah, they're very blue, aren't they? I had forgotten that about him myself until I saw him again. Half of the American laser game light gun games take place at a Wild West location. Do you have a certain fondness for Wild West content? Well, I don't know that, you know, it was uh, as much driven by fondness for it as just the location here. You know, the company was based in, uh, in Albuquerque and uh, uh, the uh, Mad Dog games were filmed at a place called the Eves Ranch, which is about 50 miles north of Albuquerque, so it was very convenient. And then we uh, shot a couple of games over in Tucson, Arizona, which is also, you know, in pretty close proximity to Albuquerque. So uh, from that point of view, it just made a lot of sense. We had the scenery, we had the horses, we had the cowboys. Uh, you know, we had pretty much everything without having to create very much. Most of your Wild West games were filmed at Old Tucson. Old Tucson, which was a similar type of place to what the Eves Ranch was outside of Santa Fe. In other words, it was a, a replica of a Western town that had, you know, a saloon and hotel and sheriff's office and jail. And, you know, it had, uh, uh, it was, you know, created and for the movie industry so that they could, you know, come in there and film scenes and have a Western town that they didn't have to rebuild every time. And they would change it a little bit. So, you know, that was a matter of convenience. After we went the first time over to Tucson, uh, then we were, you know, we made contact with some, um, you know, cowboys that were, you know, fast draw artists, say, and, you know, knew how to, you know, twirl a gun and do tricks with them and stuff and who were, you know, their livelihood was involved in like Wild West shows. And so we, you know, incorporated them into the game because, uh, you know, they looked good and, you know, had the characteristics that we were looking for. 
personally, I am very interested in the games that never saw a home conversion. One of these is Gallagher's Gallery. Could you tell us why it never received a home port? Were there licensing problems or was it just not deemed to be a commercial success? It not only was not a commercial success, but it was an utter failure. It was the worst game that we produced by a very long margin. I don't think we sold five of them. Uh, uh, it was just, you know, a game that, you know, people didn't, uh, didn't enjoy, they didn't embrace, they didn't buy it. I think we had pretty broad licensing on it, but, you know, it really, because the game was, did so poorly, we never really, you know, got into that. Right? How was Mr. Gallagher to work with? He has the reputation of being somewhat eccentric and complex. Yeah, he's an asshole. Yeah, that's what I remember most. Of he was difficult to work with. Uh, he insisted on, you know, making changes, you know, that didn't make a lot of sense. And, you know, mm -hmm. I would not blame him for the fact that the game was not successful. But, you know, mm -hmm. he, he certainly didn't help at all. And he was not a pleasure to work with. The other game that never received a home port was Shootout at All Tucson, which is very sad, as you guys intended to port it to all major platforms. It is quite a departure from your other games as it uses digitized sprites for the action segments and uses FMV just for the cutscenes. You know, we were trying to, um, you know, improve the game action in any way that we could. And, um, and so, you know, the digitization was, you know, kind of part of that effort. Yeah. Speaking of American laser game pieces I wasn't yet able to enjoy, the PC version of the game gun seems to be very rare and I wasn't yet able to obtain one. It wasn't so successful. I think, you know, part of the reason was that the appeal to the, you know, games was uh, in large part based on a large video screen, which gave it, you know, a little more reality. And the smaller you shrunk the screen, then the, you know, the more that detracted from the, you know, the real energy of the game and the appeal of it. You left American Laser Games before they ceased operations. Could you tell us something about their end anyhow? I think I left the company in uh, 1997. And so what went on after that, really, I am not, uh, you know, really very close to and don't have much of an understanding. They went off on their own direction and uh, and uh, we did not uh, part on very good terms. So I didn't keep up with the, what they were doing. I want to thank Robert Greeby for his time and effort to do this interview with me. It is a huge honor to me that I was able to speak to this pioneer of video games. This is the end of the video. My name is Ben. I thank you for viewing.